Um, it's great to have everyone with us at the sort of sort of one of our last few webinars of the year. Uh, this one is on the importance of application performance and availability. It's great to have everyone join. Uh, in this webinar, we'll be discussing uh, really just the juxtaposition of availability and performance in a modern world, uh, where we're at, where we're seeing in terms of trends uh, and data and what it means for partners, customers, as well as general users um, in the space. So I'm gonna hand over to Simon Michelson, who's head of solution architecture, and he's gonna run through the presentation. And as mentioned, if you have any questions, please don't hesitate to pop them into the Q&A, uh, but we hope you enjoy. Simon, over to you. Excellent, thank you, Gabby. And uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening to everyone who's joined us today. Um, and, um, and really to talk about uh, performance and availability um, of, uh, of applications. Um, and what can we do to, of course, deliver um, a state-of-the-art um, infrastructure to our users and, uh, and to the business. Um, so really just to, to get, us, get us started with, a, say, somewhat of a happy note, uh, it's officially shopping season. Um, and the holiday season is upon us. Uh, happy Halloween to everyone that's celebrating this weekend, of course. Um, but it's officially time to get a good deal, right? Um, it, whether it's for a big screen, ultra HD TV, you always want it, or maybe you're thinking about getting a gift to your in-laws. Um, could be anything. Uh, and it's a great time to, of course, find uh, find a good promotion. Um, so, But like you, there are hundreds of millions of others uh, that are thinking about the same thing. And uh, we, can, we can see that in this photo. Um, we have, um, I bet, probably thousands of people in this, uh, in this store. Um, and that only happened as early as a year ago, uh, of course, when we could uh, uh, be uh, as close to each other as much as, as, much as we could. Um, and we visited a store the night before. We um, studied the layout maybe the day before of how it's going to look before that um, you know, shopping starts, shopping, sh shopping season starts. And we sometimes even camped out outside of the store right, with hundreds of people. And, um, and we were eagerly waiting for, for them to open the door so we can run and, and, and purchase the products we wanted. Um, the funny thing about this photo and the really interesting thing is to see how many spectators we have. Uh, so hi to, and thank you to all of our spectators who, were, uh, who took this photo, which is uh, it's pretty impressive. Um, it's funny to see whenever you see anything like this, just uh, how many uh, are are simply taking out their phones just so they can snag a photo, or and how many are actually running to to get the product. Um, but um, if we um, if we take a look at this, right? I mean, this was an example from Black a Black Friday sale uh, at one of the largest electronic stores. Um, now we can all agree that this level of activity um, is not a usual thing, right? We don't anticipate um, th these many people uh, at the same time uh, in the store. Um, and, and what's really that's attracting those customers, right? There could be could be a variety of reasons. It could be could be sales, could be promotions, a, a limited supply of a certain stock, certain product. Um, if it's a birthday, a holiday, a weekend, uh, some people even buy when they're bored. Um, so um, it makes us feel happy and we all love getting a good deal, uh, getting a good win. Um, and that's really driving a lot of consumption. Um, but during the season, uh, right, we could have a pretty high congestion of a huge amount of people thinking about the same thing. Um, now, um, although this is, of course, this level of in-store traffic is very unusual. Uh, it's also it also occurs multiple times a year, um, and um, if we talk about different holidays, um, of course uh, we have Black Friday happening in November. Uh, we have Halloween coming up this weekend, um, but these holidays really require some special preparation, right? Needless to say, uh, being able to service tens or thousands of people at a physical location uh, can be quite challenging, right? There are, inevitably there's some constraints with how many people we can even fit in the room. Um, and if you take a look at all the different holidays we have, we have uh, Cyber Monday, that's the Monday following the Black Friday sale. Uh, we have the Super Bowl uh, in February. Um, we had Amazon Prime Day just, a two, just two weeks ago. Um, and, and of course, um, the, the era that we live in, uh, where we have to practice social distancing, a lot of this type of consumption is moving to online. 
um, as it of course was was heading that way even uh, even years ago um, but uh, but more as a result of uh, of the pandemic uh, uh, that we're in so if we take a look at at some of the really characteristics of or I would say the challenges of of how do we address in-store shopping um, and if we take a look at some of the really basic challenges of, of what we call offline businesses these are businesses that do business inside of a store they don't offer their services online um, and um, if, if we take a look for first first and foremost retailers we, uh, we want to offer products at multiple locations right well, we want to be able to cater to as many consumers as possible uh, we want to accommodate as many people uh, uh, in a room um, and this will have a direct effect on our revenue at the end of the day and the volume of business that we end up generating right a store that has uh, a uh, national presence versus local presence might see different uh, levels of success as a result of, of, of when you have greater presence, more reach uh, to your customer base, then people need to commute less to get to your store um, and, um, and of course, eventually walk in and, and, and buy a product. Um, the second thing is, of course, the product itself, right? We want to be able to design the store in the best possible way we can that offers consumers the uh, an easy way to navigate the store, if you will, uh, so they can quickly find your products and um, um, and and simply pick them up and head to the checkout checkout counter. Um, by the way, some interesting an interesting fact: uh, just in, in Black Friday alone last year, there were reportedly about 124 million people. Um, who purchased inside of a store. Um, now that's a huge amount, a huge amount if you think about it. Uh, this is about more than a, more than a third of the population of the of North America. This is almost twice uh, the amount of, uh, of people in uh, in the UK, um, and just generally an impressive amount of people to 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 accommodate um, at, at at physical stores. Um, and of course, when you think about it, in a single day, right? So. Um, the level of people coming in and out of the door. Um, now, the third thing is, of course, the checkout, the checkout counter, which we're all sensitive to. Um, long wait times at the checkout counter has a direct impact on the level of business. Um, we all, we all just dislike standing in line for 15, 30 minutes, and even sometimes more. Um, and inevitably, it, um, uh, it has an effect. Um, sometimes we even may choose to just leave the product and, and just leave the store. Um, and, um, and, and of course, that could result in, in loss of business for that retailer, for example. But of course, there are many other challenges that are not covered in the slide. Um, things related to manpower, employees, marketing, supply chain, store design. Uh, these are all things that those uh, offline businesses have to really think about before um, they um, they promote and, and and head to these big sales and, and holiday sales. Um, now, the interesting thing is that you know many of these uh, challenges uh, are also relevant to uh, online businesses and online shopping as well. So, if we try to kind of draw the comparison and take a look at, at online businesses, um, similar concepts apply here as well. Um, but online businesses don't have as many constraints, that said, to, uh, to offline businesses. For example, um, if you think about real estate um, and uh, the fact that the consumer has to commute to your store and find parking and he has to wander the store and look for the product in the right aisle. Uh, these are things that could, uh, that could take time and uh, in many cases could even come in the way of that, uh, uh, that consumer from, from deciding to eventually come to the store. And, and, and place the purchase. Um, now, that's why we saw the growth in online shopping uh, even before uh, the pandemic. I would say that the pandemic simply exacerbated, uh, kind of accelerated the, the adoption of, of online uh, shopping. Uh, and it is getting more and more sophisticated. Uh, obviously, there were things that we used to even walk into the store for, uh, whether it was to try on a shirt uh, or, um, you know, to take a look at a product, um, like looking at the at the TV before we uh, we place an order. But we're getting more and more confident and comfortable with making decisions online based on comments, based on reviews. Right? There are many other factors that we could uh, um, we could leverage to to make a good decision uh, of of what what to buy. So, for example, in Black Friday, there were 124 that shopped in store, 
uh, but there were 142 million that uh, were doing the shopping online. Um, so that is a very impressive number. We can see that even 50% more of the sales um, um, on Black Friday last year were uh, online, uh, online sales. Um, now, additionally, when you think of the nature of an online business, um, it has more reach, right? Um, the expansion is a lot easier. They can quickly expand to any, their activity to any region or any country with significantly less efforts. Uh, when you think about uh, leasing a property, hiring employees, uh, payroll, designing the store, uh, these things that could take uh, quite a significant uh, amount of effort to, to stand up in order to be able to offer your products um, and um, to, to a specific uh, country or city or, or any location. Um, so if you take a look at stores, right, we wanna make sure that uh, our online store is always open. Um, the difference between an online and an offline business is there are no defined working business hours, right? We have to be open 24 by seven, 365. Um, if our online experience um, or our online store experiences any kind of an outage or is offline for any reason, that equates to essentially the door being closed and we have consumers outside who are not even able to get into the, in through the front door. Um, and that in turn means uh, loss of potential business because they might decide just to go with a competitor or they might go elsewhere to uh, uh, or might decide just to simply not purchase the product. Um, and uh, and if we take a look at, 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 at navigating the store itself, the online store, we wanna be able to offer a very slick design, right? A design that is uh, um, allows a user to easily search and look for products um, so they don't spend a significant amount of time kind of scraping the store, looking at wandering between the aisles um, so they can immediately um, 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 get access to what they want and be able to add it to their cart. And then of course, lastly, we wanna be able to offer our Swift checkout experience, right? Through various types of payment services. Um, you know, one of the good and, and bad things about offline businesses is that you, you can predict and manage the capacity of people in a store and even manage wait, um, how long it, it takes to wait in a, in a checkout, checkout line. But, uh, um, um, you might be losing people if they are uh, impatient um, and of course to wait in line. And with online businesses, you wanna be able to accommodate as many people as possible. Um, I think the, the, the photo that we saw earlier is really an, a, a, is a true example of that. Um, um, imagine where you had all these people along with hundreds of millions of others sitting behind a computer or on their mobile phone and they're trying to march in through the front door, right? Um, um, and they're all trying to do that all at once. Um, even um, 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 uh, e e even even walking into a store, that many people at the same time could be challenging. And that is also applicable to online businesses where you have enormous amount of traffic uh, or an uptick in traffic um, of people wanting to 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 go in and 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 um, and, and log into your to your websites. Um, and, and some data points, and thank you for Google that we have um, these incredible data points that can help corroborate everything we're describing here that feels natural to, to many of us, um, but it's really interesting to see the, the facts in reality. Um, and um, if we take a look at Black Friday last year, it was on November 20, 29th, uh, there was about a thousand percent interest peak um, comparing to uh, two weeks before. So November 1st, uh, all the way to November 29th, you can see the difference between uh, before and of course also after uh, that uh, that uh, big shopping spree. Um, and that that peak, that that peak of interest, that uptick in, in traffic really presents a challenge for all of us who are uh, uh, retailers, um, 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 anyone who's providing an online capability today that uh, might have volatility when it comes to how many people are really walking into our store, uh, if we use that kind of analogy again. Uh, we also had Amazon Prime Day, and that was just two and a half weeks ago. I think it was October 13th and 14th, um, about 770% interest peak. Um, and as you can see, there's a, a, a pretty big difference um, uh, in the graph when it comes to uh, the level of traffic that gets generated uh, of people coming into our website. Um, so 
if we, I'm sorry, let me do this. I'm gonna move on to the next slide. Uh, if we take a look a little bit, um, uh, a little bit beyond um, online shopping. Now we, we use that analogy to, to to maybe kind of describe the point of of we want to be able to address that uh, volatility in uh, in uh, or anomaly in, in traffic. Um, in many cases, uh, we could have uh, those public holidays. They might be driving traffic, but there could be other instances where we could have a spike of of, of users trying to to browse our websites, and that is applicable to various types of industries, uh, from education, financial, healthcare, uh, and of course, businesses today. Um, so several industry, industries have been shifting rapidly to due to the ongoing pandemic to uh, uh, really um, increase their online activity. Um, and this is starting from, of course, um, uh, virtual learning. So uh, we can see virtual classrooms. Many of our schools remain closed uh, and higher education like colleges and universities are learning um, through online platforms. Um, and all the communications is done through any type of instant messaging or uh, a platform where they can submit their assignments uh, or, or you know, collect their test results. Um, now, if we also take a look at healthcare, uh, there, conti there continues to be a huge amount of innovation for next generation telemedicine. Um, I think one of the things we've realized is that we can really leverage technology to improve upon how we care and monitor uh, patients uh, and the relationship between a doctor um, and, uh, uh, and a patient. Uh, and that includes things like online prescriptions and online pharmacies, um, uh, the ability to video chat with your patient and, and check up on him. Um, so th these are all, um, services that we are now delivering online and needless to say they're mission critical uh, we don't want to have any type of outage or 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 a reason not to be able to offer a prescription to to a patient that needs it and furthermore uh, we don't want to interrupt the classroom of of a teacher and, and 40 students um, so these are all uh, of course key points where um, um, the uptime of the system and the ability to to address a, 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 a random number of, of users uh, becomes uh, a very important factor in our in, in the way we design and think about those systems and how we implement them. Um, and lastly, when we think about business and, and many of us who are uh, responsible for delivering infrastructure to to our company, to our edge devices, to users who have been working from home for seven months. Um, we also hear some some articles saying that some big some of the big tech companies even discuss the possibility of allowing their employees to work from home uh, permanently, and uh, we want to offer uh, those users um, a state of the art workplace from home and uh, essentially so they can quickly access their business applications uh, and remain productive. Inevitably, what happened during this pandemic as we moved to start start working from home, we became distant from where the infrastructure uh, resides. Uh, we're no longer in, in an office that has that has a direct link to our data center or to the cloud. Um, and um, with as a result of that distance, um, we are now as IT professionals are looking for ways of externalizing a lot of those business applications we used to run internally so users can start working remote uh, and they have access to everything they need to, to do their job. Um, so these are all mission critical services, um, and we are very sensitive to their uptime, uh, their availability, their performance, um, and, um, and 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 second, of course, when we think about uh, uh, the way the world we live in today, there are no defined business hours, if 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 you will. Um, um, users can um, perform their assi assignments at night on weekends. Um, uh, we as business users can log on on the week weekend and, of course, uh, uh, get a little bit of work done. Uh, and, of course, when it comes to telemedicine and when you need care and assistance, uh, that, is, that is, of course, has to be uh, offered to you 24-7 uh, and, and whenever you need it, um, according per your convenience. Uh, apologize for the noise. Um, now, if we briefly take a look at... And draw the comparison between brick and mortars, brick and mortar businesses, offline businesses, and uh, and online. Um, and 
if we measure them in, in four different categories, if we take a look at capacity, distance, availability, and, and speed. Um, it, so if we take a look at, at capacity, for example, um, with offline businesses, there's a limit to the number of people we can fit in a store. With an online business, theoretically, that could be virtually unlimited. Uh, we can accommodate as, as many as possible. Um, and we could also be facing traffic volatility. That, again, is the, the, the metaphor to having thousands of people trying to walk into your store at the same time. So that could present a challenge of how do you, uh, how do you scale um, and, and be able to cater and offer services to so many people who are requesting it at once. Um, we have those holidays that play a big, uh, a big deal in, in the uptick in, in, in user traffic. Um, and of course, sales, promotions, weekends, these are all um, um, situations where we would anticipate to see an uptick in, 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 perform, in, in activity. The second piece is, of course, distance. Um, um, and specifically with uh, offline businesses, you have to commute to the store. And again, think about parking and, uh, and the time it takes to navigate the store, purchase the product, put it in your trunk and drive back home. Um, as opposed to online businesses, we have the opportunity to um, really offer the best possible experience. So the time it takes for a user to navigate and, and, and look for a product or a student to obtain an assignment or for uh, a patient to receive care, uh, we have an opportunity to architect it so it's extremely fast. Um, and, and, and that business users can launch a desktop to his workstation and be productive in a matter of seconds. So we want and we have the ability to offer a state-of-the-art experience um, and, and really minimizing the time it takes to, um, to, get, to get access to resources. Um, and then if we take a look at availability, um, we, uh, of course, with the brick and mortar example, we're limited to the number of stores we have, uh, whether it's local, regional, national, or even worldwide presence. And that could play a factor in, in how effective we are and, and what uh, what size of the market are we able to address. Uh, with online businesses, um, our main priority is ensuring that the door is always open, is that uh, is uptime, is ensuring that uh, our website is never experiencing any type of outage um, and uh, and be able to really maximize the um, our efficiency um, uh, throughout uh, uh, throughout the entire um, period of over 24 hours. Um, and lastly is sp speed and speed, of course, related to to performance. And, and I think I took uh, the, the example I, I, I correlated here is how long it takes to wait at the check checkout counter. Um, and what can we do uh, during that time as opposed to in the online businesses, uh, we can offer an instant checkout through various different types of, of services. Um, and essentially, there's no wait time. We don't have to wait in line to get an assignment, to uh, wait for a, a doctor to see us, or even for um, uh, for a virtual desktop to, um, to to be spawned up for us to be able to to start uh, doing our job. Um, so these are all um, challenges, but also opportunities we have, right? Uh, as far as looking at an online activity and the types of challenges that we can bridge to offer the best possible experience to our users. Okay. Now, if we take a look at, um, and this is a very interesting data point, um, and what causes, what, what's, ca what, what's causing users to leave uh, websites and services? Um, the following data point shows that no matter how we invest in in design and and how attractive and appealing our website e is, the number one reason remains how quickly the website is loading. Um, so this study shows that um, users become impatient. Uh, if uh, a page takes more than three seconds to load, we're risking losing that user um, in that activity, risking losing it to a competitor, to um, it could be a situation of again a user not receiving the proper care uh, or or access to a resource, um, and and as a result becoming less effective. Um, now you can also imagine it for yourself. I think we all have very high standards as users and as consumers in our personal lives. And imagine you have to uh, again wait at the checkout counter for thirty minutes or even. Uh, online have to wait three seconds for every page to load whenever you click on on an element. 
Um, you know, they say the customer is always right, and 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 we have a very high demands. But uh, um, um, what's really interesting to see is that uh, this is uh, embraced by the top, um, you know, top leading websites um, in uh, in the country. And these are this is a consideration that many of of businesses uh, have today. Um, is how can we improve the responsiveness of our website as well as the uptime um, to to make sure that our users are happy at the end of the day. Uh, and this is a very interesting data point that I took from uh, PingDom. PingDom is a service that lets you profile and measure how quickly your website um, loads. Um, and this is an example from Amazon, Apple. Last Atlantis is uh, a big gambling website. Um, and of course, Alibaba. Um, so you can see that they're all at the three second mark or, or significantly lower. Uh, with the gambling website, of course, taking the lead because it's extremely sensitive to ensuring high rate of, of transactions, right? Um, we we want to be able to offer the best possible experience for those uh, for those gamblers. Um, but um, this is our this is essentially the competition, or this is eff effectively setting the standards. These are um, companies that recognize that the users uh, have high demands when it comes to um, um, their platform, and they uh, could potentially experience a loss of revenue, a loss of business if um, they were to if they weren't uh, investing in 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 ensuring high performance and, and availability of their platform. Um, and what's interesting to see is the number two is. Uh, um, is a pretty it's a pretty interesting fact that number two is is when the video and audio auto plays when you um, when you click on a web page, um, and I personally also uh, tend to agree that uh, this is uh, a little bit uncomfortable uh, when uh, uh, things start play uh, without without you explicitly clicking on them, um, and the third thing is is of course design poor design. So um, if if we're able to meet the performance. And then the second, um, what, what's second to that is, is of course, how good of a job we do when it comes to designing our store. Uh, how does it look visually? How is how easy it is to navigate? Uh, and whether we create kind of a, a very smooth and, and easy experience for our users to to to, to look look for their uh, look for the products. Um, so how do we solve that? How do we address slow loading of websites? Or what are the key challenges that? Uh, that might cause a website to um, to load slowly. Um, so one is, um, and the first one, what we call long distances, is a simply a, a result of physics and in, in, in science. Um, so that's called in, in the industry latency. Uh, latency essentially um, describes the distance um, it takes to send a message from A to B and back from B to A. Um, that is, of course, um, subject to the speed of light. There's only uh, there's a limit to how fast uh, elements can travel um, in this world, and we know that's 300 kilometers per second, and we have to manage that. Uh, and understanding that, that could uh, add, of course, some slowness into the user experience. So uh, in this example, if we take a look at a user in London who's trying to access a website in San Francisco, um, there's inevitably some um, time they're going to have to spend in order for that uh, website to load um, because of the distance between London, the physical distance between London and San Francisco. Um, so one, what can we do about it? What can we do to kind of bridge that distance between the users? Um, so one of the things many, many companies do today is considering expanding our websites and applications to additional regions so or additional localities. Um, that same instance of a website that uh, running in San Francisco, we can deploy uh, another one in running in, for example, in uh, in Europe somewhere. Um, by doing so, we uh, we can then um, uh, we can then divert the London traffic to access the European instance, and as a result, uh, bridge the time it takes to um, to, to load that web page. Um, the second category is around what's called heavy payloads, and we um, as humans are very visual. Um, 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 we, we enjoy visuals uh, a lot, and many of today's websites leverage very rich media content, uh, high definition images and videos. Um, and these are very, very relatively large payloads that can take a while to load. Um, and um, uh, imagine opening up a, a, a large 
uh, file from or even accessing the Apple websites where they have a state of the art widgets and, and images of the new iPhone 12, it's um, it could be it could take a while for um, for for your web for your web page to, to to load on your on your computer. Um, so there's a variety of things that could be leveraged to address this particular problem. Of course, many companies leverage a, a content delivery network or CDN that what, what it does essentially is it caches static content, those images, those videos. Um, it, it provides a blanket of, 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 of caches that store uh, that static content closer to where users reside. So effectively, if I'm browsing to the Apple website from New York, um, I will have I will download that iPhone image from somewhere here in this uh, area in the Northeast, as opposed to kind of dialing back to the West Coast to to try to download it from Cupertino. Um, so content delivery network is is one, and it's a terrific solution for, of course, your static assets for uh, on your website. But um, another um, um, another aspect is related to your uh, web pages, uh, and that is um, your application servers who are rendering the web page itself, um, whether they're using compression, compression, caching. So I think one of the key examples I like to give is imagine that a thousand users uh, are trying to hit the home page of, of your website. Um, and that is the exact same um, display, exact same content for, for any user. Um, there's no reason to uh, burden your application servers with serving that uh, that home page every single time for every every single user where you could have a proxy uh, you could have an entity in the middle between your application server and your user that is caching that website and um, always ensuring that users are are served directly from the cache and and thus freeing up your uh, backend application servers to uh, to do additional processing and, and maximize their performance with 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 of course your custom business logic so caching is one aspect prefetching of of content that we know that's being frequently accessed uh and of course compression and many times applications are designed um in a certain way where um application developers sometimes uh um um, um overlook the, the need of of optimizing and compressing every single uh payload that gets sent between the client and, and the server um and therefore um, uh, a component in the middle can help um, optimize that delivery. Uh, and lastly, of course, when it comes to encryption, most of the traffic today in the in the, in the world is leveraging uh, HTTPS, uh, and that is really the gold standard today uh, when accessing websites. But that encryption does not come um, uh, for free; it comes at a cost. Um, uh, that adds additional processing power and uh, inevitably can put some strain and, and overhead on, on your application servers. Um, and we can offload that responsibility from them and, and, and ensure that they're done by, uh, by a middleman. And of course, the last category relates to your application code. Uh, in many instances, the code itself can be improved. Uh, if you take a look at that Ping Dom service by SolarWinds that I've, uh, I've mentioned earlier, it will give you a, a very interesting breakdown in, as to what are the specific um, um, parts of your website that you can optimize when it comes to how many redirects you're having, how many requests um, are you sending, um, whether you're running maybe some inefficient uh, JavaScript code, um, um, so on and so forth. Um, and, and really, the component component we're looking at to be to, to be able to bridge uh, this uh, um, and and to be able to bridge this and offer a, a better load time for our website is is called an ADC. Um, an ADC is, is an application delivery controller uh, that can help us address the two challenges or three challenges related to distance, related to uh, caching uh, content that's frequently accessed, and of course also be able to address the uh, dynamic scaling of, of, of those uptick in traffic uh, when we see in, in holidays, when we see uh, nowadays with, with the pandemic, with an increase in online activity across the board from, from again, healthcare to, uh, to education to, to business. So with that, um, I'll go ahead and, and, and introduce uh, the application delivery controller and specifically the key components that uh, help uh, improve the availability and performance of 
our, our application services and our websites. Um, so when we take a look at, at an ADC, uh, an ADC delivers essentially four key functions. Um, uh, starting off with a load balancing um, uh, capability where we can balance user traffic between multiple servers uh, and mo multiple application services on our back end. This ensures that uh, um, um, there's no single entity that's handling the entire traffic and it's uniformly distributed across multiple services and therefore we're able to accommodate a lot more users. Um, the second is, of course, a web application firewall that adds a security function, which we've covered in previous webinars. And then going forward, we have a web accelerator. A web accelerator uh, specifically addresses uh, improving page load times. And through those techniques described before, leveraging caching, compression, uh, and of course, offloading the encryption from your application servers, uh, it, it can help free up resources on your back end and be able to serve a lot of content from a cache and and as a result uh you know reduce the chattiness uh between your uh, uh your users and your application servers and then lastly we have what we call the global server load balancer the gslb is a component that's responsible for uh, ensuring that uh, our implementation is highly available and ubiquitous, um, specifically addressing the distances challenges of how do you deliver a distributed application across multiple continents, multiple countries, multiple cities, so on and so forth. It essentially is, is, is capable of diverting traffic based on your locality. So for instance, if we take an example, if I reside in, in, in New York, for instance, then I will be um, navigated, diverted to the, uh, the New York entity for uh, uh, the New York instance of the website, as opposed to if I'm trying to browse from the West Coast, I'll be uh, accessing um, some endpoint in, uh, in the California region. Uh, and of course, in in, in Europe and in and, and Asia Pac and so on, um, through um, name resolution and understanding the the physical location of that IP address, uh, we can divert the user to um, to a specific endpoint of our website. And this way, we can expand our reach. Uh, we can offer our our services, our products to um, to any location, and we can do that very very quickly. Um, and as you can see from an architecture standpoint, the ADC lies in between the user, between uh, where, where traffic is coming from, and, and your application. So on the right, you can see uh, your website. Um, that, that could be uh, running in, in a cloud provider. That could be running on-premise, on a virtual instance. It could be running on a server platform. Um, and it could be providing um, an online store. It could be providing a learning platform for students. Um, it could provide uh, a business application, uh, even a virtual desktop um, for, for your remote users uh, to work from home, uh, so on and so forth. The ADC really enables all those key functions for availability and performance on top of any application that you're running uh, at the back end. Now let's take a beauty of this and, and take a look at uh, a beauty of, 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 of a sample architecture that might help uh, maybe articulate this better. Um, um, and and um, if we take a look at the components we have on the screen, starting from the ADC that combines the load balancing, the WAF, the acceleration, uh, we have the global load uh, server load balancer that's able to distribute traffic between uh, multiple regions. Um, and uh, we have uh, our application services, our VMs, our servers, our containers. And in this instance, for example, uh, let's assume we want to offer high availability of our application across the United States and Europe, as well as offer the infrastructure both on-premise running as virtual machines in one of our core data centers, as well as running in one of our in one of the cloud providers because we want to be able to sustain a potential site failure where our data center becomes unavailable and um, in that case the cloud will assume responsibility uh, as well as vice versa if the cloud becomes unavailable then we still have an on-premise infrastructure that we're managing that might uh, might be still online to um, um, to serve our users um, and of course as you can see uh, there's a variety of, of hypervisor platforms that are supported um, and, and of course, also various different types of cloud providers. 
And essentially, um, what, what this diagram describes, depicts, is uh, uh, multiple instances of your web application uh, or your service uh, running at uh, across those data centers and cloud providers. And then fronting those, we have um, uh, our application delivery controllers. These are ADCs that are responsible for load balancing the traffic between the various servers you have running, uh, caching and prefetching content that's frequently being accessed by the users. Uh, and of course, also offloading the encryption from your backend, uh, ensuring that uh, um, um, your um, the extra pr processing and overhead um, is done at the ADC uh, and, um, uh, and, and not at the application layer. And then fronting those, we have our global server load balancers that are uh, highly available and uh, are able to divert user traffic um, according to their location. So in this example, if the left, left portion uh, becomes unavailable because the virtual, uh, we've experienced any kind of data center failure where um, um, we, we're no longer able to access any resources, um, the global server load balancer will check for the health of and, and the availability of, of your infrastructure. And if, if that becomes unavailable, um, users will be diverted to the other site um, or to another continent. Um, now that significantly, of course, improves your availability, right? At no point in time, we want to have a situation where uh, our website is down. When we have a hotel that cannot take bookings, uh, that could mean a direct loss of business. Um, and that could also influence students who try to submit uh, um, an assignment on time and are unable to do so because the online platform is, is un unavailable for some reason. So that, um, that, th that GSLB and ADC capability improve the av availability of our platform significantly, uh, as well as the performance. Now, we can do that, of course, for a variety of uh, workloads. Um, it does not have to be website workloads only. Uh, it could be, of course, uh, HTTP and HTTPS, um, SSL offloading and termination. But, um, and what you can see today in modern architectures, the performance, security, and, and availability is extremely important, not only when it comes to user traffic, uh, but also uh, what, what's called lateral traffic or in, in, in cloud traffic between multiple services and multiple components. Um, so you could have those same functions, not only address traffic coming from uh, the internet, but also traffic generated within, uh, within your architecture, where you have, for example, a web application trying to communicate with a database system, uh, where you have, you could have multiple databases and you can have multiple application servers. We want, you want to be able to offer those same balancing performance and availability you would, you would offer to your users. Um, so that is a crucial component uh, that could uh, um, um, could also be introduced not only at the at the top of the stack but also um, uh, within the architecture and between the individual components. And then, lastly, when it comes to scaling, and when we think about scaling today, um, scaling is 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 was never a simple um, um, uh, thing to do. Uh, I think every uh, every application, every vendor who was designing a system, um, truly achieving scaling um, uh, became um, uh, became an issue at some point. And how do you um, um, design system in, in in a way that not only offers that scaling capability, but offers very simple control or what, what's called hands free scaling. Um, but uh, not only be able to scale up the system or scale out the system to be able to, to, to handle upticks in traffic, but also be able to conserve costs when needed, right? The cloud and cloud computing today present a huge opportunity for us, but it's only if it's uh, implemented in the right way, if it's leveraged in the right way. So uh, the cloud introduces many interesting concepts related to, to scaling uh, and, and running workloads, but if we, simply forklift workloads and run them in the cloud, uh, we, we may not be doing things as efficiently as possible. Um, and when we think about scaling our websites and scaling um, um, and be able to handle more traffic. So if you go back to the Black Friday example, if we have a thousand of people, thousands of people walking into the store at the same time, uh, we want to be able to ensure that our system is, is ready for that, uh, 
for that level of traffic. And at, at some point, we, we don't want to end up in a situation where, where uh, a user receives an error page, for example. Um, and uh, what we've introduced, of course, here in Snap, which we'll talk uh, in greater detail in, uh, uh, in, in following in webinars, is a truly hands-free scaling capability that's uh, elastic, which means that it could scale out as uh, there's an increase in demand as well as scale in uh, when um, we can see a decrease in demand and then tearing down uh, workloads to, um, to be able to, to fit the, uh, uh, the level of activity you have on your website. Um, what this diagram shows, for example, is a component that we call an autoscaler. An autoscaler is, uh, um, is a component where you can define uh, the range. You can define the boundaries of what is the minimum number of instances of, of ADCs you want to have deployed and what is the maximum amount. And what this diagram depicts here in the middle is you can see we have an, a, a US East uh, application delivery controller and we have one for Europe. But we also have one that is appears in gray that is currently being deployed. Um, and that's exactly what we've architected. We've architected, act, architected a scaling function that does not require any type of management. You simply define the boundaries and we take care of the automatic scaling out and scaling in of the platform. Uh, what this is, why this is a great win is because um, 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 you don't have to leverage the uh, individual uh, cloud components for, for scaling. We do that and automate that for you. Um, we know how to detect uptick in traffic as it relates to an increased amount of processing being done by your servers or an increased uh, amount of memory utilization. And based on those criteria, we can choose to scale out your, uh, your, your ADC footprint. Uh, but uh, we also know how to detect, detect very low activity and then remove those uh, to make sure that you're not incurring those uh, additional costs forever. Um, and this really helps address the curve. Um, 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 we saw in the, in the in the in the Black Friday and the Amazon Prime Day example, where we want to be able to scale up to be able to handle the workload uh, uh, on November 29th, as well as decrease and 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 tear down those workloads as we get to December 6. Um, and that is uh, of course a huge win um, and a great capability that we can now offer uh, by leveraging the various different cloud providers or container platforms. Now, um, uh, a short introduction, of course, a brief introduction to, um, to Snap and, and who we are and, and what do we specialize in. Um, we, we focus on what we call global application services delivery um, and um, specifically uh, providing uh, an application delivery control function that uh, enables those key uh, capabilities that uh, uh, we covered to, in today's webinar but in a, in a fashion that is centrally managed and centrally controlled by, uh, by, by a single pane of glass da dashboard and console. Um, so we ensure that reliable and secure uh, delivery of, of application services across on-premise workloads and of course, cloud platforms. Uh, we deploy those um, um, application delivery controllers to your environment. Uh, and we give you the controls and the ability to manage them remotely. Uh, and of course, the ability to ensure that the, config the configuration is consistent across multiple uh, locations, that it's unified, and, uh, um, and of course, have more visibility into the entire health, performance, and security of your platform and your application worldwide. We were founded in 2012 by a cybersecurity expert who really took his expertise into uh, the networking and, 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 and application delivery space. Um, we're uh, headquartered in South Africa and we also have offices in uh, New York. And uh, um, recently in uh, uh, last year, we've launched our Nova platform uh, that offers a fully managed um, uh, ADC offering uh, that allows you to, again, uh, auto scale uh, and, uh, and self deploy uh, ADCs to any environment. Uh, we have a pretty uh, significant uh, uh, user base, um, install base um, across multiple different types of countries, uh, and we're serving from Fortune 500 customers to, of course, the top uh, federal and civil agencies uh, here in the United States. Now, before we adjourn for today and conclude or uh, head off to the uh, Q&A section, um, 
uh, we're going to cover uh, a short case study uh, about um, a tier one uh, consumer retail uh, uh, brand uh, offering um, products uh, worldwide to uh, to a very uh, uh, large amount of uh, 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 users and consumers. Um, and they were uh, in the market for looking for a, a unified platform that will allow them to manage their a- entire ADC infrastructure from one place. Um, they also wanted to, to do that with a very lightweight um, uh, um, uh, ADC. They, they looked at and looked and surveyed other solutions where they found that they were um, uh, qu- presented quite a bit of a burden to to uh, to their modern um, application delivery. Um, as you know, there are many um, um, uh, there 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 are trends in the market to really moving to uh, mini and microservices and and really delivering. Uh, uh, D- distributed applications worldwide because that type of architecture could then present uh, a much greater way to scale and and, and manageability and of course uh, improvements in cost um, and they were looking for an ADC that could be accommodated as a container based deployment uh, in a microservices environment and specifically they had also uh, quite a bit of, of CI and, and continuous development practices internally and they were looking for a tool that could be managed through DevOps practices, um, fully automated with controls to deploy, manage, and, and configure uh, going forward. Um, and essentially, the solution for them was to uh, replace um, 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 F5 with uh, 80 of the snapped uh, application delivery controllers, serving about uh, 90 gigabits per second in terms of traffic uh, overall. Um, in a very geo-distributed environment where they had um, that online store available to users um, uh, in North America, in Africa, Europe, and, and Asia Pac, um, and providing load balancing and, and web acceleration um, um, across across the entire region. Um, from a benefit standpoint, um, for them, the wins were, of course, leveraging a lightweight uh, and, and modern um, um, uh, container-based deployment that uh, offers a very speedy deployment uh, with less than 30 seconds. Um, and uh, of course, those automation tools where they can ongoing do change management and and, and improve upon their security configuration as well. Um, and of course, as part of that, that resulted in, in also a significant cost reduction, driven mostly by, uh, of course, the First and foremost, the infrastructure requirements to run the lightweight ADCs delivered by by, by Snapped, um, which require a very minimum amount of of, of processing and, and memory, as well as uh, a very flexible um, uh, and cost effective licensing option uh, that we offer. So, with that, uh, I would like to thank everyone for joining today, and and really. Um, 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 I hope that everybody, uh, ev- everyone enjoyed this webinar and kind of uh, covered uh, um, quite a bit of, of, of things uh, around uh, application performance and application availability. Um, otherwise, I hope uh, you enjoy your holidays, your upcoming holidays, and, uh, and of course, uh, uh, do some shopping. Uh, it's always good for the soul. Uh, that's, what I, that's what I hear. Um, and uh, if we can help you within, uh, with any of that, and of course, if you'd like to hear more about uh, Snapped uh, and our products, uh, we would be happy to connect with you afterwards and, uh, and provide you with more information. Um, so thank you very much. And uh, Gabby, uh, over, over to you.